Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Doctors shrugged, and parents were already saying goodbye to their fading son. But as soon as the nurse got down to business, Adriana, they brought a newcomer here. They transferred him from somewhere for the night. Antonio Diaz asked for you to come to his office in about 10 minutes. Seeing Adriana put aside her sandwich and getting ready to leave the chair, the orderly Beatrice quickly added, It's not that urgent. 10 minutes, not 10 seconds. He's sipping coffee himself. Look, jumping up like crazy, can't you listen first? If you keep reacting like this all the time, you won't last long at work. On one hand, it's good that there are still people like you. But usually, a year or two passes, and girls don't want to run around with patients anymore. You rarely get gratitude from anyone, but dissatisfied relatives pile up every day. Most of Beatrice's thoughts she voiced to herself, looking at the back of the young nurse Adriana with tired sympathy. A good girl came from somewhere far away. Polite, not spoiled, not squeamish. She'll find a word of support for everyone. And if she just sympathetically stays silent, she's very tired. Even the most capricious patients don't annoy her. She hasn't said anything bad about anyone yet. Some of the girls think she's just pretending to seem good to everyone. But what's the point of pretending? What's the benefit? Their hospital is ordinary, not a private clinic. In Switzerland, they probably won't reward you for empathy like for VIP service. She's just like that. It's a pity that such people rarely have luck. Most of the time, they just get run over. But if Beatrice had such a daughter-in-law, Beatrice would appreciate her, wouldn't offend her, and wouldn't let her son be offended, they would definitely be friends. But it's useless to dream. Her son has been chasing after a scandalous princess for two years who enjoys playing at love. Beatrice stood thoughtfully for another minute, leaning on the mop handle, and slowly went to the other end of the hospital corridor. Antonio Diaz called you? Adriana appeared at the threshold of the office, knocking on the door a couple of times before entering just in case. Yeah, he did. Confirmed the attending physician, taking a sip of strong coffee. We have a new patient from the regional trauma unit in the private ward who was brought in by ambulance after an accident. I need you to take care of them closely. I'll explain now. Antonio Diaz took another tired, lingering sip of coffee and continued after a pause. It's a shocking situation for the family. It started as a typical case. A young, healthy guy had a motorcycle accident. Lucky for him, the injuries were not dangerous at all, but for some reason, he's getting worse every day, although he should have been back on his iron horse by now. Naturally, they scheduled tests right away and immediately detected an aggressive malignant tumor, the growth of which was accelerated by the trauma. Of course, they sent him to us. They don't even have the right painkillers there. They brought him in by medical taxi, didn't postpone until morning. I've come across detailed descriptions of similar cases in the literature, but I've only seen this happen so quickly and irreversibly for the second time in 35 years of practice. In such cases, the chances of recovery are practically zero. Miracles happen, but it's a fraction of a percent. We'll try to alleviate the post-traumatic syndrome, the pain, and we'll discharge him home for now. The parents already know everything. I think they've mentally prepared for the worst. Now they're asking to minimize their son's suffering not only with medication, but also with quality care and attention. To create a comfortable atmosphere, as much as possible, in an ordinary hospital. They're not young people, as far as I've understood. They're sensitive, and the son is their only child. I assured them that we have a sensitive, attentive staff, primarily meaning you, Adriana. And we'll put Camelia Munoz on your shift as well. She'll be suitable. What do you think? Camelia will definitely handle it, Adriana confidently confirmed. And thank you for trusting me, Antonio Diaz. You know I don't have much experience, yet you decided to entrust me with such a patient. I've been working with people for four decades, Adriana. So yes, I know better, the doctor responded sharply, not fond of drawn-out sentimental conversations. Essentially, you just do everything as usual strictly according to the prescription. 
plus attentive care, there's absolutely nothing difficult for you here. Five minutes later, Adriana was already at the patient's room, Carlos Ramirez, 26 years old. Today is his first four drip, they need two a day. Adriana shifts alternate according to the schedule, first night, then day. Usually, after returning from the night shift to a rented accommodation, Adriana would take a shower, have breakfast, and try to get some sleep briefly. Especially if she hadn't managed to nap for at least half an hour during the night. Aunt Elena, by the time Adriana arrived, had often already left for work, often leaving a funny note under the magnet on the fridge about what breakfast awaits Adriana in the fridge or on the stove. Elena, the landlady, was alone. Her son had been living and working in the capital for seven years and didn't visit his mother. What was there for him to do? She herself gladly traveled to visit him. She arranged cultural outings for herself, as she preferred to call these trips. Elena rented out her son's vacant room. Two student girls had lived with her, and now for six months, a young nurse Adriana had been living with her, whom she called Aunt Elena. It was not boring with the young ones. Both students were nice, cheerful girls, but a bit untidy. If they sometimes cleaned up in their room, they completely forgot about the kitchen and other rooms. Elena forgave them, they were young, their heads were occupied with something else in their free time from studying. And she quietly cleaned up herself. Perhaps fate took pity on her for this and finally gave her Adriana. On the contrary, Adriana had to scold her for trying too hard to help with the household chores. You, Adriana, will earn money, go on vacation. All the tourists will scatter to the beaches to sunbathe and swim, and you will stay at the hotel helping to clean the rooms. Come on, put the mop back in its place. You'll have plenty of time to work in your hospital. You're not just polishing nails there. You pay me rent, you don't leave a mess behind, and I'll clean up after myself somehow. Indeed, Elena lacked the spirit to refuse from pure joy Adriana often treated her with something tasty. She could come up with something interesting from the simplest cheap products according to her mood. Especially pies and cakes turned out well for them. The landlady did not stay indebted. Often she cooked breakfast for Adriana when she returned from night shifts. Adriana had gotten used to the fact that she could hardly fall asleep right away. While traveling home, it seemed that as soon as she rested her cheek on the pillow, she would fall asleep. But in reality, all the events of the night shift would pass before her eyes like a kaleidoscope. Sometimes she would relive them all for half an hour or even a whole hour. It's okay, it's okay, Aunt Elena declared, learning about this. You're just still too young and impressionable. You'll see, time will pass, and you'll fall asleep after a shift and not think about anything. The body knows better than us when fatigue accumulates and rest is needed. Today, Aunt Elena's theory was bursting at the seams. Adriana's body seemed to have forgotten that she hadn't slept a minute at night and didn't remember it neither on the bus on the way home nor at home in bed. Adriana didn't even taste her favorite cottage cheese casserole with raisins, carefully prepared by Aunt Elena. Carlos, the new patient, was constantly on her mind. The strongest pain reliever possible had been prescribed for him, and it didn't start working right away. When Adriana entered the room with the four drip, she immediately met his gaze. The young man was half lying under the blanket, his head and broad shoulders resting on a high pillow. Stiff ash-colored hair, dark eyes, intelligent and stubborn. And his face frozen, pale gray, like the hospital walls and ceiling. Strong, patient, flashed in her mind. Adriana decided to behave as if nothing terrible was happening to him and all this was just a temporary misunderstanding. Good evening, I'm Adriana, your ward nurse. I'll be here all night, so don't worry, everything will be fine for you, she said, trying her best to sound calm. And immediately realized that he was experiencing excruciating pain when he, with clenched teeth, tensely responded. Carlos, nice to meet you. Please, don't talk. It's difficult for you right now, Adriana interjected with a soft request, immediately starting to set up the four drip. Of course, it's lonely in the hospital without conversation. Honestly, I myself like to chat with patients when no one needs urgent help. 
Now I'll set up this device. We'll get you the drip. It will take almost an hour, and in about 20-30 minutes, the pain reliever will start working. Sometimes it works earlier. You'll be able to sleep for a few hours, and in the morning you'll wake up feeling much better than today. When you start feeling better, it won't be risky for you to spend energy on conversations. There, all set. Lie quietly, don't move your arm during the entire procedure. Is that comfortable for you? The guy nodded, tried to smile, and quietly replied. Yes, thank you. It happens sometimes. A person is sick and helpless, and it feels so good and peaceful next to them. It's as if he consciously decided to help Adriana so that she could help him. Miracles happen, but there are one in a hundred Antonio Diaz words came to mind. Let Carlos be in that one percent immediately flashed in her mind as an address to unknown higher powers. And then Adriana's gaze fell on some dark object between Carlos and the wall adjacent to the bed. Oh, how thick! Adriana approached the head of the bed and picked up the book from behind the guy's back. I respect those who still read paper books. Electronic ones just aren't the same. Although, I don't know how to explain it. I'll return it in the morning, I swear. Right now, after the drip, you need to sleep, she said, her gaze lingering on the book, whose author's name she only just read. Oh, it's Dune. The very first one? I read it not so long ago, and now I've started the second one from this series. Carlos smiled again, with a completely different expression. And Adriana guessed and firmly responded to the silent request. No, don't even ask. It's not allowed. Although, how about I quietly read it aloud to you? We have almost a whole hour. I see where the bookmark is. You've only managed to read a few pages. All the interesting parts are still ahead. Lucky you. Adriana pulled up a chair to the bedside table, where it was convenient to place the book, opened it to the page with the bookmark, and began to read quietly but distinctly from the very first paragraph. Adriana read, often raising her eyes from the book to the fore drip, then to the patient's hand and posture, everything was in order. Occasionally, looking at Carlos's face, she met his eyes. And when she lowered her gaze back to the book, she knew he was still staring at her intently. People distract themselves from physical pain in very different ways. Many focus their attention on some object, watching it. Perhaps Carlos felt even a little better when he looked at the nurse reading to him. As promised by Adriana, half an hour after the four drip, Carlos was able to fall asleep. The night in the ward was calm. Adriana went around the rooms, everyone was asleep. While she was busy at the duty station with patients' cards, attaching test results and images, she listened attentively to the silence. Sleep swept away like the wind, although she hadn't even made her savior a cup of coffee yet. At home, Adriana still managed to sleep for an hour, but the sleep was restless and sensitive. Upon waking up, she opened the curtains and discovered that the clouds that had been hanging over the city for three days had finally dispersed. The sun seemed to appear, and it immediately warmed up. Summer began to feel like summer, it was some kind of good sign. Adriana decided to go for a walk. Walk through the park to the market, buy strawberries, bake their favorite berry sand tarts with Aunt Elena. After all, something had to be done to bring the time of Aunt Elena's return from work closer. She wanted to share with her the events of the past shift, tell her about the new patient. As if, if you remember and talk about it all the time, it will be easier for him. Elena listened more attentively than usual to Adriana's story, allowing herself to be distracted only by her favorite pastries, capable of sweetening any mundane troubles. Not only did they deduct the shortage from everyone's salary in the store, but also nothing good happened to the girl. She still doesn't understand what got into her. If only she weren't such a homebody, such a dangerous nonsense wouldn't have happened. There are plenty of healthy guys around, and all evening she just talks about the incurably ill patient, unable to get him out of her head. Yes, yes. That's too bad, Aunt Elena said aloud. But still, we need to take a break from work, think about ourselves too. If we don't take care of ourselves, Adriana, no one will want to take care of us. That's just how it is. 
Your patience will be the first to suffer if you don't rest. And I don't want to think about the bad things. I want to think about the good things. How about we go to the movies today? There's a light comedy playing downtown. Let's have a laugh at least. Can't we suddenly take a break on weekdays? We're not old ladies to waste away at home. Especially not me. Elena was even proud of herself for persuading Adriana. Next time, they'll make it to a disco or something. But not everything at once. Adriana grew up far from here. She doesn't have any friends her age in this city yet, but Aunt Elena is just as good. All normal people enjoy vacation, even those who love their work, if there's something important in their life besides work. But Adriana could have missed her first vacation in her life if she hadn't been reminded. Well, Adriana, consider all the pieces falling into place, announced Antonio Diaz. Starting from Monday, you have your scheduled vacation. And your patient Ramirez, we're discharging him home on Friday, which is tomorrow. And you won't have to delegate him to anyone. Discharging him? Where? Adriana was flustered. He can barely get out of bed without painkillers. Home, Adriana. Home. We talked about this when he was admitted. You have a good memory, girl. We did what we could for him. We didn't make any mistakes. His parents are grateful to us. You've been caring for him like a sister for over a week. Now they'll hire an experienced caregiver to follow all the instructions for his relief at home. They're not millionaires, but they can afford it. And for any person, as soon as the need for hospitalization disappears, they immediately feel better in a relaxed home environment. Believe me, it's that simple. Adriana? Antonio Diaz asked sternly and concernedly, as if the nurse hardly heard him. Yes, yes, I hear you, Antonio Diaz, she tried to sound sensible and calm. He, in response, tried to change his tone to a more confidential and gentle one. Adriana, listen, you won't see too many hopeless cases like this, even if you dare to stay in the profession for a lifetime. Usually, the results of your help will be visible to the naked eye. You'll help a bunch of people, our resilient girl. But for that... You need to live and rest properly, otherwise your enthusiasm won't last long. So starting from Monday, you'll cheerfully head into vacation, Adriana Alonso. And now go and work, you still have two shifts, today and from Saturday to Sunday. That means today is the last chance to say goodbye to Carlos. Adriana pondered for a long time and couldn't decide for herself, is it right not to tell him his diagnosis yet? His parents asked for that. They were thoroughly explained why there's almost no hope. But either they disagree to give up hope, or they haven't found the strength to tell the truth to their son yet. Adriana approaches each shift with the thought, I hope Carlos doesn't figure anything out today. Visiting hours were already over, but someone's cheerful voice could be heard from the ward. Adriana cracked the door open and saw an unfamiliar girl next to Carlos. The striking blonde with smooth long hair was animatedly spinning on the chair, shoving her phone under the guy's nose and carelessly narrating. And here, we're in Mallorca with Elvira and Mom, look. Not a single cloud in the sky, that's how it was the whole vacation. And in Palma, one of the most beautiful bays in the world. And this, when we went to the dragon's cave. The girl elegantly adjusted the strands of linen hair falling on her face and spoke nonstop, not noticing that Carlos was listening to her completely indifferent. Even from the threshold, Adriana could tell. He knows everything that's happening to him. A terrible suspicion pierced Adriana, and she clasped her suddenly cold palms, feeling the tremor in them. Nonsense. Don't make up anything without solid grounds. She needed to talk to Carlos as if nothing happened during the last procedures. Just a little bit more to endure. Adriana had long ago made plans for her vacation. She would go back to her hometown to visit her parents and sisters, whom she missed dearly, although she tried not to admit it to herself. Thankfully, there were video calls that made it feel like her family was right there with her. But not all family members were included in these plans. There was her grandmother, living in the village by the river near the sacred mountain. A small, stubborn grandmother indifferent to the conveniences of civilization. 
She wasn't even willing to reconsider her beliefs slightly for the sake of chatting with her beloved eldest granddaughter for more than two minutes on the phone. The rare occasions when the grandmother decided to make a call were remembered by the whole family. Throughout the entire history of mobile communication, there were fewer of them than fingers on both hands combined. The grandmother considered face-to-face -face communication to be genuine. Mom, you don't think about us at all, tried to persuade her daughter Camelia, Adriana's mother, and the mother of two younger twins. You don't want to move to the city, you think you're more needed here. Well, we respect your decision. But it turns out you live far away from us, all alone, and we don't even know if everything is okay with you. Yes and no are not enough words to pull out any extra information over the phone. If something happens to me, you'll feel it right away. Be sure of that, Camelia, the grandmother smiled calmly. After all, you're still my daughter. And if not you, then Adriana, my beloved granddaughter and namesake. A cell phone is for those who don't really want to see their loved ones. You make a call, check the box that you've shown some attention. But I always think about all of you, you know that. And you just come visit me whenever you feel like it. And Adriana's grandmother, in whose honor Camelia named her eldest daughter, always somehow knew when guests would come to her without any phone calls. No matter how much they checked, they never caught her off guard. The most delicious pies, salads, fragrant herbal tea with honey were always ready exactly when the relatives arrived. And no one was surprised by that. The grandmother, a retired librarian by profession, was actually a special person, knowing something that was inaccessible to most others. But she never demonstrated her superiority to anyone. It's given to some and not to others. She would simply say and help anyone who needed her assistance, both people and animals. She treated many serious illnesses with herbs and tinctures. As some claimed, she even performed rituals on the sacred mountain. The grandmother didn't take any money, but she could accept a small gift if she felt it was given from the heart. One very rare thing, but it happened, she would refuse the visitor. Several years later, the villagers still remembered the story of how Adriana's grandmother refused to treat some important official who had arrived from afar with a convoy of three cars. I just came to Adriana Arias for a cough remedy for my youngest, the main witness of the incident, Emilia, the mother of three lively boys and a neighbor, recalled. She gave me the remedy and went to see me off on the porch. We were still chatting there when they arrived. You could immediately tell who was the boss. He pushed his belly forward and entered the garden through the open gate as if he were entering his own house. And the escort followed each shoulder like they were glued. He swam like an honored guest, aiming for the door. But he didn't get past the porch. He saw us and announced, I'm here to see Grandma Adriana. And Adriana Arias simply replied, I won't be able to cure you. You wasted your time coming here. I was frozen with surprise myself. I had never heard of her refusing like that on the spot. The boss darkened, looked at her irritably, but restrained himself. He wanted to find out why this rustic old lady treated him like that. Like, how could this be? One of his subordinates recommended her. She cured him of a chronic bronchitis while the doctors were already threatening him with asthma. And he, supposedly, was even ready to pay according to the rate of a solid clinic. So he said, let's go inside for a detailed conversation. And Adriana Arias stood in the doorway and shook her head. I see you have an ulcer. I won't take up treating you. I'm not a quack. I don't like to lie. I won't do it. And he had to leave. He turned around and swore quietly, but loud enough for the grandmother to hear. She wasn't one to take offense at us, waved her hand after him, and that was it. I couldn't resist. I asked why she refused. She said, the reason here is insurmountable. Until a person changes, he cannot be cured and he won't change. Ulcers like his only appear from insatiable greed. Once I advised such a man to use what he gained through deceit to treat sick children, and they sent all kinds of inspections to me. They came from everywhere, threatened with everything. It was a long time ago, you were little, but your mother remembers. I secretly treated people for two years after that, held consultations in other people's homes. 
and when your heart is not at peace, treatment becomes more difficult and slower. It's good that the local authorities changed quickly back then. They forgot about me, and everything went back to normal. Adriana walked home from her shift. She left the hospital on a misty, fresh morning after a night shift and felt like taking a walk. There was no rush anyway, and she thought it would be better to be on the move. How could she have not thought of her grandmother right away? She should go to her first. Her parents wouldn't mind if Adriana went to her grandmother first. Perhaps her grandmother would be able to help Carlos? But she needed to talk to her face to face, not over the phone. And let her grandmother understand everything right away. When there are no other options to save a person, you can't pay attention to trivial matters. From the very beginning of her vacation, it seemed like someone had put in a good word for Adriana with luck. She met her grandmother almost a day earlier than she had expected. Instead of her father, her cousin Felix met her at the station. Coincidentally, he was also meeting a couple of his classmates here, who were planning a mountain hike. Both of Felix's friends were here for the first time, and at every turn, they were greeted with views that amazed their imagination. Even the air smelled different here than what they were used to. Perhaps that's why the guys tried to catch Adriana's attention the whole way with their constant banter, competing with each other in wit. Remembering the traditions of hospitality, Adriana tried her best to look interested so they would think she was listening to them. Here it was, the half-forgotten descent from the pass, and then the burial mounds again. And there were ancient petroglyphs on the rocks. Very soon, after three long years of separation, two Adrianas would finally meet. Hello, Adriana. My namesake, the grandmother would say, and the sunlight would sparkle in the cheerful wrinkles at the corners of her eyes. Hello, Adriana. My namesake, returning from the neighbors, the grandmother simply stopped at the gate of her own garden just as the car opposite her came to a halt and her granddaughter was the first to step out. The other passengers intentionally lingered a bit, giving them time to exchange glances alone. Granny. Adriana breathed out in relief, sinking into the warm embrace of her grandmother and trying to close the circle of her arms around her grandmother's slender back. Invite the guys. Felix and whoever else is with you, the grandmother winked. We'll feed everyone, give them a rest, and then send them off on their journey. And then we'll have a thorough talk, face to face, my golden swallow. Don't think about anything heavy right now, just rest a little with everyone. When her grandmother asked her to rest, everyone close to her knew it was impossible to resist. Eventually, they would forget their worries for some enchanted hour. Adriana didn't even rush. Before she knew it, the hungry tourists had had lunch and were off again, leaving her and her grandmother alone. The grandmother watched the departing car, took Adriana by the elbow, led her back into the house to the antique teapot, seated her beside her at the table, and said, Well, tell me. Adriana recounted everything that had happened in the month leading up to her vacation. Adriana's grandmother sat comfortably in silence for a few minutes after her granddaughter's story was finished, as if weighing something. She stroked the teapot, walked to the window, surveyed her living room with its patterned beige wallpaper, and the bright red huge cat, who was shamelessly dozing on the flower shelf, curled around a pot of scarlet geraniums. Rojo, will you stay here for a little while without me being the boss? I'll ask Amelia to feed you and you'll look after her and her kids, the grandmother addressed the cat. Rogo raised his head and looked attentively at the younger Adriana, as if assessing whether she was worth enduring such inconveniences for her request. After a moment of thought, he lazily stretched out his front paws, spread his fingers, and extended his long claws from the soft pink pads. Thank you, darling, for allowing it, Adriana Arias's grandmother thanked. Francisca Velasco lived a completely ordinary, routine life. For many years, she taught economics at the same college, went on vacation to the same seaside town with the same husband, and stayed at the same well-kept house owned by the same hostess. Those who knew her not too long and not too closely didn't believe that she wasn't tired of such a monotonous routine. She herself was a little embarrassed by it. Perhaps a modern and sophisticated woman should have long been outraged by such a life, but it didn't bother her in the slightest. 
This was exactly what she wanted, a caring, reliable husband and a wonderful son, Carlos. In her youth, the stories about such families seemed like comforting, sugary tales for young girls. And now, she herself had had such a family for many years. Little Francisco was constantly afraid, both for herself and for her mother. At home, many things seemed much better than for most of her friends, but only at first glance. Everyone knew and didn't hesitate to say aloud that Francisca had a wonderful father. He had an excellent position, could negotiate with all the right people, get everything they needed, and buy everything. With such a man, there was nothing to be afraid of. Oh yes, there is. Little Francisca mentally objected, never daring to say it out loud. Behind closed doors, her father became a monster. He never missed a chance to insult his wife, ridiculed his growing daughter, and raised his hands, claiming that both of them needed to be taught. There was always a reason to lecture them. Her mother didn't work, so she only had to cover up the bruises from beatings when she went out. Not as often as Francisca, who had to show up at the institute every day. She fell asleep in class, trying hard to hide her yawns, as if someone might catch her and report to her father that his daughter couldn't stand the promising specialty he forced her to study. When Ignacio, a fifth-year student from the neighboring law faculty, started courting her seriously during her second year, Francisca had a hard time hiding her joy. For the first time in her life, everything worked out so well for her. When her father inquired about Ignacio's family, his eyes gleamed with the thought of a profitable marriage. But for her, there was only one thing that mattered to free herself from her father's power. Ignacio had come, indifferent parents, busy with their own lives, and a separate apartment quite far from both families. Without hesitation, she married him and felt completely happy even without any great love. And when, after several long years of anxious waiting, little Carlos was born, the great love in her life finally appeared. Her son became the meaning of her life, immediately and forever. She even feared a little that her husband would realize that she had never loved him, seeing how she looked at her son and comparing. But her husband wasn't bothered by such nonsense, and he didn't engage in comparisons. Carlos grew up quickly, causing no particular trouble even in his teenage years. He didn't need to be forced or persuaded to do what was best for him. He liked a fairly prestigious faculty where he enthusiastically began to build his career, getting a job through his father's connections at a promising company where his father had also been working successfully for several years. And the determined daughter of his boss, Isolde, who really liked Carlos, also liked him. And the boss himself didn't hint subtly at all that the idea of joining the Ramirez family pleased him greatly. And when Francisca Ramirez triumphantly noticed with a fluttering heart that her Carlos was starting to show Isolde the first serious signs of attention, a cursed accident turned her carefully built world upside down. Carlos wouldn't marry Isolde, wouldn't become a co-owner of the promising company alongside a smart, savvy father-in-law. It would be lucky if Carlos lived for another couple of years. And if he managed to live at least a year without excruciating pain, it would be considered a big stroke of luck. Francisca Velasco refused to believe it for a long time. While her son lay in the city hospital, she consulted with completely different specialists online, adherents of traditional and non-traditional medicine. The medical luminaries jibbled terms, but they all answered in different words, more or less the same thing, there was almost no hope. And Francisca Velasco understood that this almost was just a formality. Doctors had agreed to respond this way, unable to help. There was only one thing left, she had to prepare herself to tell her son the truth. Her husband insisted on it too, the boy was no longer a child, let him decide for himself how he preferred to spend the remaining measured time. But when Carlos was discharged from the hospital, he suddenly felt better. He looked just as energetic and tireless as he was before the accident, and his parents decided to postpone the terribly oppressive conversation. What if... Francisca Velasco's thoughts spun around in her head like a top. And when this unexpected nurse from the city hospital called, whom she barely remembered, the mother only tiredly said, Thank you, dear, our son is feeling well. We appreciate your involvement, it's very kind of you, but we consider which doctor's involvement completely unnecessary for now. 
Yes, thank you again. Wait, the quirky girl persisted. Could you please write down my phone number anyway? I sincerely hope you never need it, but just in case. Yeah, sure. I'm writing it down, go ahead, agreed Francisca Velasco. She wasn't a pretentious woman and genuinely appreciated gestures of concern towards herself and her family. So she mechanically noted the dictated number and even tucked a scrap of notebook paper with the nurse's number into the book she had just finished reading. She didn't believe Grandma Adriana turned to her grandmother, who was calmly knitting a mitten from homemade yarn. Maybe you wouldn't have believed her right away either, the grandmother replied. You want me to call her? Adriana stayed silent. Of course, she never doubted from the beginning. Her grandmother would see the truth right away. Grandma often said that everyone has two explanations ready for any action, one beautiful, the other real. It's terrible to want this, Adriana sighed. She didn't know what to do or think anymore. Her grandmother, who had never traveled so far from home before, immediately agreed to go with her. To live together in a cramped room on the seventh floor. And Aunt Elena readily agreed to host them, firmly refusing any increase in rent for the time her grandmother would be staying. Do you think I'm morally bankrupt? Elena scoffed, offended. I thought we had a decent relationship, you and I. And if you thought I'd refuse to take in your grandmother or ask for money for it, well, you're quite mistaken, Adriana. Grandma immediately endeared herself to Elena. Adriana Arias was nothing like the spiteful old women huddled by the entrance, feeding on gossip about the residents. She even made dough for pies that was so special. It was so light and airy that it could only be made by fairies or witches. Adriana and her grandmother spent two days strolling around the city. They bought a couple of huge bright flowers in wide pots for Adriana's room at the market, picked several pristine white mushrooms in the forest park on the outskirts, greeted Aunt Elena from work with cakes and ice cream. And on the third day, Francisca Velasco, Carlos's mom, called with a fragile voice. Adriana, is your grandmother, the healer, still there? Would she mind looking at Carlos? Understand, Carlos is very unwell, the previous pain relievers are no longer effective, they only relieve the pain briefly. When can you come over? I'm on vacation right now, my grandmother is staying with me. She's right here with me, Adriana replied as if through a thick, sticky fog. We can come at any time, it's 15 minutes. My dear, please, I beg you not to tell my son how seriously ill he is. He's far from medicine, even further than me, and still believes it's post-traumatic. And if you happen to see his girlfriend, please don't tell her either. I'm willing to pay very well for the outcome, whatever you ask for. I've researched the cost of such emergency services, I even consider it underestimated. Of course, we're being offered chemotherapy, radiation. But, if the same doctors who offer it can't guarantee anything, I seriously wonder if it's worth subjecting my son to such torment. With the pace of this disease, he has little time left. My husband insists I'm wrong, but I'm not sure of anything anymore. I'm sorry I can't stop. It's better not to discuss this over the phone, right? We'll settle with you, just please come over. Adriana glanced at her grandmother. She was already silently and attentively packing her small, neat backpack. With all her might, Adriana wished it meant the same as usual, everything would turn out fine for the sick person. Ramirez lived on the outskirts of the city in a private sector, in a small but sturdy house surrounded by an apple orchard. When the grandmother and Adriana arrived, the homeowner, Ignacio Ramirez, was at a work meeting. Francisca deliberately timed it for when her husband wouldn't be home. It wasn't that difficult. Ever since Ignacio learned about his son's illness, he had been trying his best to shut himself off from the dreadful news with work and affairs. He just wanted to be home less often and not see all of it. After all, his wife had once persuaded him to have a second child. She had begged for a long time, feeling something, while he was staunchly against it. He steadfastly maintained the same stance, it's better to give more to one child, to provide them with all the conditions for development, excellent starting opportunities. 
and she wasn't a broody hen to dedicate her whole life to diapers and parent-teacher meetings, he addressed her without understanding. She was a successful teacher with excellent reviews. None of her students had ever regretted the money spent on education. And his wife remained silent, looking pitiful and lost. He should have listened to Francisca, instead of considering her a sensitive fantasist who didn't even know what she wanted. What for? For whom now was his entire career, all his established connections? What was the point? Now he had to continue doing all this out of inertia, just to avoid falling apart completely. Ignacio was not used to being weaker than circumstances and had already forgotten that not everything in life depends on a person's will and desires and efforts. Francisca Velasco also remembered how she tried to convince her husband that they needed a second child. She hadn't been resolute enough, hadn't tried hard enough. She couldn't overcome her childishness and honestly admit to her husband how much she wanted another child, if not two, then at least one baby. How happy she would be to leave her unloved job for this, the job she forced herself to go to because it was expected. By whom was it expected? Others always decided everything for her. But now, when it came to the life of their only son, she would decide for herself how to help him. If her husband didn't want to believe it was his business, let him continue to run away from trouble. She decided to invite a healer home. She took a long time to choose, hesitated, even feared. A completely unfamiliar person. It's quite possible that a hypocritical charlatan would come to the house, examine the suffering Carlos, ask questions, predict the outcome of the illness. Or she might even dare to indicate the reason why such a thing happened to their family. Francisca felt completely exhausted, her nerves were frayed and resembled ringing cobwebs. And at that moment, from the novel by Francois Sagan, which she was preparing to put on the top shelf of the bookcase, a scrap of notebook paper with a phone number fell to the floor. She remembered it was the number of Adriana's grandmother, the nurse from the city hospital. She offered her grandmother's help. Francisca couldn't explain to herself why, but suddenly she sighed with relief. Here was what she needed. Frightened, desperate Francisco was internally ready to see anyone, but Adriana Arias would never suspect witchcraft at first glance. From behind, the grandmother of Nurse Adriana could be mistaken for a teenager. Small, slender, she had a nimble figure not typical for her age. Loose jeans and a simple striped shirt worn over a t-shirt and a khaki backpack like those carried by young tourists on vacation also confirmed the initial impression. The most difficult thing was not to show rude surprise after looking at this woman's face. When you look, you unexpectedly realize that she is no less than 70. Weathered face, dotted with fine wrinkles. There were especially many of them in the corners of her kind, perceptive eyes. She could have been an old Indian woman from an old adventure novel, Francisca Ramirez thought with unexpected sympathy. Please come in, she said, letting the guests through the gate into the garden and escorting them along the path to the house. While we have a few minutes before meeting with my son, I'll ask you for one thing. After the examination, please tell me the truth right away. I'm ready for it. Can you help or not? I'm not stingy. I just don't want to hope in vain. I don't feel strong enough to bear it. Don't worry, Adriana Arias promised briefly. It goes without saying. Before, when Carlos heard the expression the most important thing in life is health, he considered it a sign of encroaching old age. There are so many interesting, even truly exciting things in life to dwell on health. It's enough not to ruin your body with constant drinking, lead an active life, and everything will be fine. What happened to Carlos after the car accident and injury made him look at things completely differently. Six months later, it seemed to Carlos that a whole lifetime had passed since the day of the accident, chaotic and cruel, managing to teach many things. First of all, he had to make an effort not to let his mom know that he knew about his illness. Perhaps because he had behaved like a teenager for too long, his mom still considered him a little boy who couldn't analyze facts and draw independent conclusions. The names of the medicines prescribed to him in the hospital, the tests and procedures, all those dreadful pains when you almost lose control of yourself. Fragments of medical conversations sometimes heard from the corridor internet searches indicated the worst. 
He had to pretend to his parents until the end that he didn't suspect anything. It would be easier for them for some time. He didn't want to think about what would happen next. Carlos just tried to cut off such thoughts. Strangely enough, only one thing pleased him. Isolde came to see him in the hospital only once. At that time, painkillers were still working fairly well, and Carlos met her, pretending to be almost perfectly healthy, with the demeanor of a holidaymaker at a sanatorium. Isolde talked about her vacation, most of which was always taken up by shopping. And he pretended to listen attentively and waited for her to leave. He didn't have to wait long, Isolde didn't plan to stay long. She had always admitted that she hated hospitals. The atmosphere in them is so dreadful, she confessed, and that's why she never visited friends or acquaintances who happened to be in the hospital. Only for Carlos did she make an exception. I've been summoning up the courage to come here for a long time. She elegantly put her hand to her mouth, smiling, waiting for his gratitude for her sacrifice. Now that life had changed so much and promised to be much shorter than he had planned, Carlos found it easier to tell himself the truth. He didn't love Isolde and never had. Yes, she was beautiful and striking, an educated girl from a good family. They looked good together. He was momentarily enthralled by her interest in him. Besides, he really wanted to earn respect from his father, who couldn't be persuaded to take his son seriously. But it's one thing to be a young specialist, whom his father vouched for in front of his superiors, and another thing to be the boss's son-in-law. His father, finally, praised Carlos and expressed hope that he would achieve something in life. How does he feel now, his father? Thinking about it, Carlos seriously felt something akin to guilt, even though he understood that it was unfair to consider himself guilty. Back in college, many of Carlos's classmates envied him for having such a father who did everything for his future. That was absolutely true. But the father seriously expected his son to reciprocate for his investments, and Carlos grew up with this thought. And after Isolde left, lying alone in the hospital ward, he clearly understood, if he were healthy, he would definitely have married her, just to make his father consider his project successful. Now he was relieved of the need to prove anything to his father, but it didn't make him happy. The way out was too dreadful. The only thought that he wouldn't have to marry Isolde now brought a silly childish joy. Yes, only an utter fool could look for positives in his situation. On some website, Carlos read that such illnesses have a devastating effect on the psyche, change personality. And it seems that he himself, Carlos Ramirez, is confirmation and a vivid example of this. Completely absurd thoughts and feelings had insidiously settled in his mind in his condition. He awaits the arrival of the nurse, Adriana, from the city hospital. Seeing her is the only event that gives his existence some meaning. He was amazed at how this girl diligently pretends that nothing special is happening to him. Looking at her, he almost believed it himself she was so skillful at it. How much strength must she put into this? Where does this fragile girl get it from? She chose such a difficult, ungrateful, and low-paying profession so that other people, like him, would be lucky when they end up in the hospital. And he was also ashamed to appear helpless and irritated because of the constant pain in front of her. And Carlos tried to at least maintain the appearance of stubborn optimism and good spirits. Let the nurse, Adriana Alonso, be pleased that her involvement makes it easier for the patient. Carlos was discharged from the city hospital home with a recommendation to go to a specialized clinic. Probably where they give the last illusion of hope to people like him. Mom found an experienced home nurse with excellent recommendations. This pleasant woman performed her duties flawlessly, but she was not Adriana Alonso. Carlos mentally mocked himself. He was going crazy from illness. He imagined a fairy tale that the girl treated him specially, but she just worked by calling and now she was taking care of other patients with the same warmth. Maybe she also reads to someone in the evenings. For some reason, this last thought was particularly unpleasant to him. When the effect of the pain reliever began to rapidly decrease, Carlos realized that his mom was close to telling him the truth. He should stop tormenting her, start an honest conversation himself. But he couldn't bring himself to do it. And when he thought he had made up his mind, his mom entered the room with a question. 
Carlos, do you remember your ward nurse from the city hospital? The girl named Adriana? She offered us help. Her grandmother lives in the village to the north and has been practicing alternative medicine all her life. In other words, she's a healer. And she's here now. She came to her granddaughter. If her words are to be believed, she has all the necessary means with her to help you. I can't decide this without you, but I would try. Please, son, let's try. Of course, let's try, mom, we have nothing to lose, Carlos confirmed confidently, fearing that his nervous mom would change her mind and he would have to persuade her herself. Whether the herbal remedies and her manipulations would relieve him or not, he would definitely see Adriana again. The anticipation of this event alone made his own life no longer seem so miserable and disgusting. When Adriana Arias' grandmother entered the room, the oppressive atmosphere of illness gradually dissipated into the secret dark corners. Before, Carlos would have laughed at such a comparison, but now he felt that it was exactly like that. Thin as a girl, smiling grandmother with mischievous sparks hiding in her eyes, as if she had just come for a visit, not to a seriously ill patient. And behind her, Adriana, her granddaughter, entered. Now it's clear, it's hereditary for Adriana to illuminate the space around herself. The healer tied the ends of her plaid shirt in some cowboy knot, sat on a chair by Carlos's bedside, held a concentrated and seemingly listening gaze on his face for a moment, and then confidently said, Yes, we will heal. We will cure you. Carlos even noticed out of the corner of his eye how the struggle between joy and disbelief reflected on his mother's face, then quickly turned his tense gaze to Adriana standing behind his mother. He saw it clearly, he didn't imagine it under the influence of drugs or protective self-deception, as licensed psychologists would explain, tenderness and hopeful happiness shone in Adriana's eyes. They exchanged a long gaze, but the girl was the first to snap out of it and looked away. Adriana Arias said that for two weeks she would need to visit the patient every day from early morning and stay with him alone for a short time without his parents. Your concern is very strong. When I feel it, it's harder for me to hear how the illness behaves. And I can't afford to make a mistake, she explained to Francisca before saying goodbye, when Carlos could no longer hear them from his room. But when I brew herbal teas, mix the infusions, you can be present freely and help. It will be even better. Medicine made with loving hands is doubly healing. Of course, yes. Of course, Carlos's mother said in a rush and looked up at Adriana. You should come too, please, if you find the time. Let's have coffee together, chat with Carlos, he needs it so much. He's all alone. No one has visited us since he was discharged. All his friends turned out to be fair-weather friends. They only have enough energy to write a couple of formal words of support in internet chats. And soon even that will become tiresome. Please come. I understand you're on vacation. Sorry for being pushy. Adriana wanted to ask for permission to come together with her grandmother, at least occasionally. And she pondered on how to ask Carlos's mother politely. I'll definitely come, she promised. It's very fortunate that I'm on vacation. I've missed my grandmother, and now I'll be close to her and learn her craft. I sometimes don't understand the nonsense I say myself, Adriana said to her grandmother as they walked out through the garden gate. When I said learn her craft, Francisca Velasco looked at me suspiciously, as if I were a student of the magic faculty. Well done. You're already as observant as a real witch, the grandmother almost cheerfully snorted and, measuring Adriana with a piercing gaze, added, We arrived in time, you don't have to worry so much. Over the two weeks that Adriana's grandmother visited the Ramirez family, even the household's owner, Ignacio, tolerated her visits. It wouldn't have been possible to hide the healer from him anyway, the grandmother and Adriana came before he left for work. They greeted him warmly and amiably, teasingly refusing to notice that he wasn't pleased to see them. Fine, let them come. Francisca became much calmer, even seemed to rejuvenate, and Carlos somehow really felt better. Looking at him, whether you wanted to admit it or not, it had to be acknowledged. However, after two weeks, his wife stunned Ignacio Ramirez with news to which he didn't know how to react. 
Ignacio, Carlos is feeling much better. But this course of treatment is not enough for his recovery. He needs to go north with Adriana Arias. It may take a month, two, or three. Everyone needs different time. The medicines Carlos needs work best where they grow. Look at that. What an interesting turn this is taking, whistled the experienced lawyer. Has Adriana's grandmother struck gold? Ignacio, why don't you temporarily set aside the scammers you have to deal with? His wife's voice took on unfamiliar firm tones. We're talking about our son's health, even his life. You may not believe it, but even you know such cases exist and can't deny them. Sometimes traditional medicine is what saves a person from death, and money will only be needed by Carlos for food. By the way, now more than ever, I'm confident in Adrian Arias' abilities. She said we could draw up a written agreement that the compensation is solely in our discretion and not in monetary form. She anticipated your petty question. So, for the first time in his life, Carlos went north and lived in Adriana's grandmother's house until mid-October, obediently taking all the remedies she deemed necessary. The nights grew cold, the air became clear, and the rivers took on a magically turquoise hue that isn't seen in summer. Carlos felt like he was born anew. He even volunteered to help the old lady fix the crooked shed, and she didn't object, silently tolerating his urban clumsiness, which he was acutely aware of. And soon, Francisca Velasco flew with happy news. One evening, her son called her and announced, Mom, don't worry. To cut to the chase, I got checked at a major regional hospital. There are no malignancies. None at all. I bought a train ticket for Friday. Can't wait to get checked again at home. And yes, if there are any doubts, I'll also get checked in the capital. But personally, I have no doubts. I'll call when I'm on my way. Carlos was torn between longing to go home and fearing the return. During his time with Adriana Arias, he never once spoke to Adriana Alonso, neither on the phone nor through messengers. Their farewell was spoiled by a stupid coincidence. On the very same day, Isolde decided to come over unannounced. She entered like the most awaited guest at a birthday party, a flawless guest with a fruit bouquet from some food florist for the sick person. It was as if she deliberately timed her visit so that Adriana and her grandmother wouldn't have left yet. As it turned out later, his mother couldn't resist and told her about the powerful healer and her granddaughter. Thank you both so much, cooed Isolde, elegantly bowing her head. I always hoped and believed that Carlos and I would eventually marry, and all these troubles were just a temporary test of our strength. Isn't that right, darling? We'll be grateful to you for life. Of course, I'm willing to wait however long it takes for Carlos to return, because I'm sure he'll come back healthy. And thank you for your confidence. It will also greatly help Carlos, Adriana responded, her eyes shimmering with warmth. Carlos wanted to immediately declare that there would be no wedding with Isolde. Absolutely, guaranteed, there would be none. But he understood it wasn't the right place or time to say anything to Adriana and she probably wouldn't approve of such a silly theatrical performance insulting another girl. So he left. In the stairwell, Adriana Arias sometimes pierced him with her quick all-knowing eyes. He was sure she didn't shame him only because he was ill, and he wanted to overcome the illness if only to be asked about his health like a healthy man without humiliating pity. Ignacio Ramirez was furious. He was never superstitious, but now the facts laughed at him, the granny healer really didn't take a penny for treating his son. And while Francisco was racking her brains over what valuable gift to give her so that she would accept it, she had long since made her choice. She had chosen the gift of the boy himself for her granddaughter's sake. Yes, the lawyer Ramirez didn't believe in love spells. What else could you call it? The diagnoses from three different clinics couldn't all be wrong simultaneously. His son was once hopelessly ill, but now he was healthy. The doctor said yes, official medicine still doesn't have a precise explanation for how this mechanism works, but occasionally it happens. That one in a hundred. And now, his handsome, healthy, energetic son was coming home and stating that he wouldn't deceive or give false hope to Isolde because he loved another. And it was futile to say that gratitude shouldn't be confused with love. 
that this was just romantic foolishness, just joy that the nightmare was over. That he needed to see a therapist who would help him understand himself, not ruin his life over a whim. Feudal. Here's the translation. Francisca, Carlos's wife and mother, unexpectedly sided with her confused son. Transforming from a usually serene purring cat into a determined panther, she puzzled everyone with her statement. I've never had a voice in this house, but now seems like the perfect moment to change that. So, I'm fully on Carlos's side. All these weddings for clan interests are deeply unappealing to me as well. I want to see my son not only healthy, but also happy. In short, I want it all, and now seems like the opportunity. It appeared that neither the wife nor the son were joking, and the misunderstanding with the boss, who adored his self-centered daughter, would have to be resolved by Ignacio. It seemed he was the only one guided by pragmatism rather than love. Elena went on the offensive again, trying to prove to Adriana that she was wrong. You're so stubborn where it's unnecessary, she began patiently once again, feeling the time was right. Yet, when it comes to the most important matters, you're ready to give in like some spineless jellyfish. Nobody is telling you to throw yourself at the guy, to impose your love on him, taking advantage of his gratitude. That's truly foolish and unattractive. But letting him know that you like him is perfectly acceptable and necessary. Let him have a reason to think and choose. He, by the way, has the right to know he has a choice. He has a fiancé, Aunt Elena. They've known each other for a long time, and everything between them has long been decided. And you're not sorry for your guy? Elena questioned, gearing up for a convincing argument. He was never mine, Aunt Elena. And you're not sorry that he could have been yours, but won't be because of your foolishness? Elena wasn't easily thrown off track. And you're not sorry that he might marry such a girl? She popped into the hospital to visit him once, then disappeared like a fleeting vision. She only showed up at his house when she heard he was feeling better. Just in case he recovers and slips off her hook. And if he doesn't, she loses nothing, she'll act according to circumstances. Aunt Elena, you don't know the person, yet you're speaking ill of her. Things may not be as you think. Oh, really? Of course, Aunt Elena's been married for a year now. I'm not saying this for no reason. The sister of my replacement worked as a maid in their house and literally quit a month ago. So while your Carlos was sipping Adriana's grandmother's herbal teas, this girl of his was out clubbing with other guys. She even has a more or less steady favorite among them. She managed to jet off to Europe with him for a festival for a week. Are you suggesting I pass on these rumors to him? Adriana asked sadly, unyielding. No, Elena rejected the suspicions just as firmly. I suggest calmly looking at the situation from another angle. Judging by your stories of your meetings and conversations, you didn't leave your patient indifferent. I didn't say anything like that, Adriana retorted stubbornly. He's just grateful and well-mannered. Oh, come on. Elena waved off. What's really funny is that he might be sitting there thinking, this Adriana is just an angel of mercy. She's like that with all the sick people. So here you are, acting like two fools. Who needed to bother us again during an important conversation? First, they check the meter, then they bring the pizza to the wrong place. Upon hearing two short rings, Elena deftly slipped her feet into slippers and went to open the door. Adriana remained seated in the kitchen, listening to the conversation coming from the threshold. There was no trace left of Aunt Elena's recent dissatisfaction. Her voice sounded unusually cheerful and friendly. I thought they brought us the pizza again and got it wrong. Now I regret not taking it, my innate decency got the better of me. But flowers, they're even better. Adriana will be thrilled. She loves all flowers, but these roses are especially beautiful. As for me, I love pizza. Unable to contain her curiosity, Adriana stepped out of the kitchen to see who Aunt Elena was being so kind to, hinting at pizza. In the hallway stood Carlos, sun-kissed, slightly flustered, with a bouquet of cherry roses in hand. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.